Okay. All righty. So I am Jim Adamski. I'm a sales consultant with uh, CDL Maple Equipment here in Wisconsin, based out of Kadat. Um, my family and I own and operate a small commercial sugar bush up in Northeast Wisconsin. So um, been tapping trees and making syrup with my family for around 40 years. So we're, uh, we'll uh, get started on the, on the tapping seminar. So, so really I'm going to start out with, you know, why is sap sweet? You know, so really all summer what's going on is that tree is conducting photosynthesis and throughout the summer month, as the photosynthesis is taking place, that's that tree is basically, you know, building starch. Okay. And it's sending that starch down into the root system of that tree. So as we go through the late fall and into winter, basically what happens is we transform that starch into sugar to basically protect that tree from the cold. So usually the colder winter equals more sugar. This year will be interesting to see. I know some of the folks that have started producing sap over on the uh, western side of the state, sugar has been a little bit lower. Uh, some of the sugar contents down in Iowa have been a little bit lower as well. So we'll see kind of how that all plays out. Uh, sugar content in the sap really varies, you know, by tree, um, you know, tree size, genetics, you know, and, and the day-to-day -day of the sap run. So, you know, this is where we'll probably, you know, jump in and clear up some of the misconceptions. You know, when we look at tapping the softwood varieties uh, of the maple family, you know, the red maple and silver maple, say, for example, uh, those tree can produce just as much sugar as the, you know, hard maple or the, you know, black maple. So, um, you know, when we look at the tree specifically, you know, you know, a red maple and a silver, like say, can have just as sweet a sap as the, as the hardwood varieties. So. so really what's happening at, at night, and if you look at the slide here, I'm going to try this, uh, this fancy little laser pointer out here. If we look at the slide over here on the left, basically what happens is when we go um, below freezing, what that tree does is it really goes into a state of vacuum. And what we do is we draw liquid up from the root system of that tree up through the stem of that tree as that weather goes below freezing. Now the opposite really takes place during the day. So when we go back above freezing, what happens is a slide on the right here, we are basically forcing that sap back down that tree toward the root system. So therefore, if you're on gravity methods of syrup production without using mechanical vacuum, we need that freeze thaw process to move the sap in that tree. So if you're using bags or buckets or gravity tubing, we need that movement of the sap, that you know, freeze cycle at night to draw the syrup sap up the tree and that going back above the freezing to force that sap back down the tree. Okay, so that's really what we need is that process to move that sap in that tree. So when we look at, you know, lower atmospheric pressure, say, for example, when we look at low atmospheric pressure days, that's typically when we see a, a really good run of sap. So I'll give you a great example of, of, of atmospheric pressure. So when we look at the sapwood of a tree, we, we kind of picture that sapwood as a sponge. And the higher our atmospheric pressure goes, the more pressure that we put onto that sponge, the smaller the pores get and the harder it is for the sap to free flow out of that tree. So when we look at a high atmospheric pressure situation, so say for example, we had a night at our sugar house, it got down to 27 degrees, the next day it warmed up uh, to about 45 degrees, and by one o'clock in the afternoon, our sap really kind of quit running. Um, we looked outside, you know, it's beautiful, it's 45 degrees, there's not a cloud in the sky, and it's just a gorgeous day, why did my sap quit running? Well, that high atmospheric pressure that was placed on that tree really kind of closed up that sap wood and didn't allow that sap to free flow out of that tree. Now, the opposite takes place in a low pressure situation. So when we go into a low pressure situation, whether it be an incoming snowstorm, an incoming rainstorm, what happens is we really take that pressure off that sap wood of that tree and we allow that sap to free flow out of that tree a lot easier. So myself as a, a commercial producer of, of maple syrup, you know, we use a vacuum tubing system. So we're putting that tree into a low pressure situation pretty much every day that we have our vacuum pumps on so that we can get the best run of sap. Okay, factors that influence flow. So when we look at what factors really influence our flow, you know, one of it is really the length of that freeze thaw process. 
you know, so we really need that tree to be, you know, below freezing for an extended period of time. The longer that tree is below freezing, the more liquid it can pull up from the root system of that tree, the more sap that it can, you know, push back down the tree when we go back above freezing. You know, so a couple of quick examples of this, say, for example, you're, you're boiling a uh, sap at your sugar house and, and we start to freeze up already at seven o'clock at night and we don't go back above freezing until noon the next day. Well, that tree was under a period of vacuum for a prolonged period of time and we could draw a large volume of sap up the stem of that tree, which in turn we can force back down the tree when we go above freezing. So when we get into a situation like that, we'll, we typically have a very good run of sap. You know, the opposite kind of occurs when, say, for example, we don't freeze up until, say, three o'clock in the morning. And by, you know, 8 a.m., we're, we're back above freezing again. So we were only below freezing for just a few hours. That tree did not have much of a chance to draw a lot of liquid up the stem. So we don't have much sap to force back down that tree the next day. Uh, wind is definitely a factor, you know, windy days in the, in the woodlot, um, you know, keeps them trees relatively cool, slows down our flow. Um, we talked about atmospheric pressure um, and, and what that does to our, our runs of sap. Uh, we talk about the micro, microclimate of a region. So I live up in northeast Wisconsin. I've got Lake Michigan about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes east of me. Uh, Lake Superior is about two to two and a half hours north of me. So if I get a wind out of the northeast or north or east, um, we really cool off quite rapidly. And my run of sap, you know, is definitely affected by that. Brings my temperatures down and I don't quite get as warm here. So, you know, like say the climate of your region or where you're at definitely plays into it. Um, snow coverage, you know, as a producer, I like to see snow coverage. Um, I like to see snow around Thanksgiving time and keep it all winter. Unfortunately, this year is not the case. Um, the reason I like snow coverage early is I don't want to see a lot of frost in the ground. Um, typically, when we set a, you know, a good amount of frost in the woodlot, um, you know, all of our sugar is stored down in the root system of that tree. And if we through, freeze that root mass up solid, you know, we typically don't get a lot of sap until that root system of that tree thaws back out. Uh, precipitation level definitely has a little bit of an influence. Um, so we're going to see if, if everything holds true here. You know, so we've got some pretty detailed production records at our sugar house. I look back at, you know, the spring of 89 following the drought of 88. We had a, a really good year. You know, I look back at the drought of 2012 and in the production year of 2013 was a, an exceptional year. So, you know, in our area, at least where I live, we were in a D2 drought most of the summer. So it'll be interesting to see how, uh, how the crop yields uh, turn out for us here this year. Typically coming out of a drought, we usually have a fairly good year, not always, but, uh, you know, at least a few that we have on record at our place uh, showed a pretty good, showed a pretty good yield. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about tree growth, okay, and, and what, how a tree grows and what happens when we're tapping a tree. So if you look at this slide, you'll see uh, number one through 19 listed in a circle here. So what happens really when we drill a hole into a tree that hole remains in the interior of that tree and we grow wood over the outside of that tap hole. So in north central Wisconsin, we usually, you know, maple trees will grow anywhere from one tenth of an inch up to a quarter inch per year. And that's new growth of white wood. So when we tap that tree, say, for example, on year number one, on year number two, year number one, we usually grow anywhere from a tenth to a quarter inch of wood over the top of that hole. So as we tap this tree all the way around in a tapping pattern, and we tap this tree for 19 years, or 20 years, say, for example, we will grow anywhere from three to five inches of new wood over the top of that old tap hole. So we can actually go back on year number 20, and this is kind of exaggerated here a little bit, but we should be able to tap right back in the, in the position that hole number one was on year 20, and we should not hit that old tap hole if our tree is healthy and, and growing, like I say, a tenth to uh, a quarter inch a year. So that's really kind of what's happening internally or some of the things that are happening internally inside of that tree. So when we look at the anatomy of wood, basically what we have is we have these channels that 
the sap is slowing up and down in. And that is really, that's that gravity or that gravity process or that freeze thaw process to get that sap to move up the tree when it's freezing and to move down the tree when we go above freezing. Now, if we are using vacuum in our system, we can also move sap horizontally through the channels as well. So that's really kind of the anatomy of the water, what the sap wood looks like that's actually conducting the sap up and down in that tree. So how many taps per tree? You know, we tap with some really conservative guidelines. So usually we look at a tree that's, you know, eight to 20 inches in diameter is gonna be a single tap only, and 20 inches in larger will be two taps only on healthy trees. And we will never go three taps or we will never go four taps because what will happen is if we over tap that tree, we're not tapping it sustainably and we're putting more brown wood or non-functional wood into that tree, then that tree can grow back in the course of a year. And we'll discuss more of that kind of as we, as we go through this whole seminar. So when we look at yields, so this is a study that was done quite a while ago, back in 2008 and 2009. And if we look at this yield, this yield was, you know, using vacuum and the same plays into, you know, traditional gravity methods of production as well. You know, when we put a single tap into a tree, we were seeing a yield of around 9.67 pounds of maple syrup per tap. To correlate that out, maple syrup is 11 pounds per gallon. So let's say we were seeing about 9.67 pounds of sap or syrup per tap on a single tap. And if we went to a two tap situation, say we put two taps into that tree, we were getting about 6.4 pounds per tap or about 12.8 pounds per tree. You'll see here in the yield data, when we added the third tap and we added the fourth tap to that tree, the overall tree yield remained around that 12.2 to 12.6 pounds per tree. So really what this study is showing us is it's showing us is, you know, if we put more than two taps in that tree, what we're doing is we're creating some additional wounding and we're not getting any more yield out of that tree. So at two taps, we essentially reached our law of diminishing return. So, okay, so this is what a tapping pattern looks like. And I would strongly recommend, and we're gonna talk about tapping patterns and, and different things throughout this program. This is just a picture from one of the trees out in our wood lot. And you'll see that, you know, here is a tap hole. We have a tap hole here. We have a tap hole here. We have a tap hole here. So the tapping pattern that we have ad adopted at our sugar house is when we drill a tap hole every year, we move four inches to the left. And the next year we'll move four inches to the left. And the next year we'll move four inches to the left and we will move all the way around the whole diameter of the tree. We will tap all the way around the tree. And we're gonna get into you know, why we need tapping patterns. This is just an example of a tapping pattern that we have out there. And like I say, we're gonna talk about these just a little bit more of the, in the presentation. So like I say, when we go to tap, we always wanna make sure we locate the previous year's tap hole. And, you know, when you develop a tapping pattern at your sugar, sugar bush, you know, always tap in the same direction year to year. So say, for example, you know, every year, say, for example, you want to move to the right versus moving to the left. That's 100% fine. But as long as we adhere to every year, we're going to move to the right or every year we're going to move to the left. As long as we follow that, you know, you know, for the lifetime of our sugar bush or the lifetime that we're out there tapping, will come up with a really nice tapping pattern. We want to make sure that we're tapping higher than the lateral lines for our best yields. Um, we also, if we're, if we're using tubing, we want to make sure that we have our, our tubing lines um, straight or sloped um, above our lateral lines just to make sure that we always keep them empty. We want to make sure our lateral lines slope down. And, and this is probably, you know, one of the things, you know, tap all the way around the tree. So probably some of the worst advice that I got as a sugar maker growing up was from my grandfather. And he said, you know, we always want to tap on the south side of the tree. We always want to tap there because it's warm and the sun is shining on it. It thaws out quickly. Well, that's really not the case, you know. So we're going to show some slides here later on in the program that show, you know, what happens when we strictly tap on the south side of the tree. 
So like say when you ad adopt that tapping pattern at your sugar bush, you know, we want to make sure that we're working our way all the way around the diameter of that tree. So wood grain. So, you know, when we go to drill a tap hole in that tree, we cannot necessarily see what's going on underneath the bark. Okay. So what I did is I was out in a wood lot and I just took a picture, say, for example, of a tree that has a frost seam in it. Okay, so this is my example of my frost seam right down this, this line here. So when we see that frost seam, that is really what the grain of the tree or what the grain is doing underneath the bark. The only way that we're able to see that is with that external seam on this particular tree. So there are some tapping patterns out there um, that say, this is our first year's tap hole. And what we should do is we should move to the left three inches and up six inches. And then the next year over three inches and up six inches. Well, the problem that we run into is like I say, we cannot see under the bark when we go to tap. And if we get wood grain that looks like this or is like this, so I will tap here. And then the next year I'm gonna tap here. Well, I'm going to hit the stain column from my last tab. And we're going to talk more about stain columns here shortly. But if I follow this pattern, this over three and up six pattern, which is one of the patterns that's out there, if my grain in my tree ain't necessarily straight, there is a possibility that, you know, year one, I'll have a good tap hole. Year two, I'll have a poor tap hole. Year three, I'll have a poor tap hole. So next year, I would come here, tap here and then here, and then here. With that type of pattern, I'll always, you know, with the grain of this particular tree, I'm always gonna be running into my old wood, which will dramatically reduce my yield. And then we'll talk about that, like say here, just a little bit later on in the, in the program as far as what's happening there. So, so with that being said, I'm just gonna scroll back and look at this tapping pattern. Even if my wood grain, if I had a terrible twist in my tree and it ran at a 45 degree angle, the wood grain, I would never hit that old or that old tap hole stain by taking this type of pattern and working my way all the way around the tree. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, so where to tap? You know, we should always stay, stay at least, you know, three to four inches away from last year's old tap hole. And that's going to be to the left or to the right of an old tap hole. You know, an old tap hole sometimes will, will make a bump on the outside of the tree that is very visible and easy to see. Um, we also want to be mindful that if, if there are prior tap holes in that tree, that we are going at least 10 to 12 inches above or 10 to 12 inches below that tap hole to make sure that we're always, you know, setting or drilling that hole into some nice white uh, functional wood um, that is conducting sap. And a really good way to look at this is, you know, when you drill into that maple tree, you're going to, you know, you can tell yourself, you know, or you can really kind of test yourself as to how good of a job that you're doing. When you drill into that tree and you start to pull out that drill bit, we should be looking at nice white wood. Okay. We shouldn't see a lot of brown tapping residues. If we're, you know, bringing out a lot of brown tapping residues, you know, we're hitting non-functional wood inside that tree. And there's a good possibility that we're tapping too close to a frost seam or we're tapping too close to some other tap holes. Okay, so this is really what we're gonna get into when, it, when we talk about you know, the process in which a maple tree heals itself. So when we look at the process of compartmentalization, that is really what is happening inside of the maple tree the minute that we, you know, we go to drill that hole. So what happens when we drill that hole into that tree every cell that comes in contact with that tap hole, when microbial contamination enters that tap hole, that cell wants to wall itself off so that it will not move any liquid inside of that tree. So this way of compartmentalization or isolating the wound is a maple tree's natural way of healing itself. So when the tree starts to heal itself, the tree makes a zone of what's called non-functional or compartmentalized wood 
which is typically dark brown in color, <clears throat> excuse me, where no water will, will no water will circulate inside of it. Okay, so once we tap that tree, we put the tap hole into the tree, that stain column, once that stain column or that non-functional wood column is in that tree, it will never conduct sap again. So the non-functional wood zone, you know, increases until basically the wound is all isolated, okay? So when we are tapping a tree, we are wounding the tree, you know, so we need to minimize that wound as much as possible. One, not by over tapping. And then like I say, we're gonna talk about some other procedures that, that help limit the amount of compartmentalization that's taking place, you know, internally inside of that tree. <laughs> Excuse me. So when we look at the factors that influence that stain column or that amount of non-functional wood that's, you know, taking place inside that tree is one, is the growth rate of that tree. You know, so if that tree is nice and healthy and it can heal itself, that size of that, that stain column or that non-functional wood will definitely be smaller, okay? So, you know, as we get a tree that is possibly a little bit stressed, possibly in some state of decline, the growth rate or the stain column in that tree will get to be a lot larger because that tree can't heal itself faster. Um, use of sanitizer products. You know, sanitizer products are not meant to go in the tap hole, okay? The use of sanitizing products kind of interferes with that tree's ability to heal itself. You know, so I'm a, I'm a product of the 70s, unfortunately, and, and we had a, a product called, you know, Sap Flow Tap Hole Pellets, which is essentially paraformaldehyde that was being used in our trees. Um, you know, these, these pellets were put into the trees to, to keep the tap holes open and increase the run of sap for a longer period of time. You know, little did we know back in the day when we were using that product that we were really doing a lot of damage to our maple trees. Eventually that product was, you know, pulled off the market by, I'm not exactly sure of the date, but I'm sure it was probably the, the mid to late eighties that that product was definitely taken off the market. Um, hole diameter, you know, the larger the tap hole we put into the tree, the larger the non-functional water that stain column gets to be, you know, so, so as an industry, you know, back in the, Back in the mid 1990s, that's why our industry really pushed to go from that 7 16 tap down to that 5 16 tap so that we could, you know, reduce the amount of non functional wood that we were putting in the tree. The yield difference was very minuscule. I believe, if, you know, I'm going from memory here from some of that research that was done in the mid 90s, I believe it was only about a 5% uh, reduction in yield from that 7 16 diameter tap to the five sixteenths diameter tap, you know, so as an industry, everybody said, you know, it was really a no brainer for everyone to just adopt that small tap. Let's take better care of our trees. Let's put more, less non-functional wood into that tree. And, you know, let's keep our forest that much healthier. So it was a, it was really quick for our industry to, to switch over to it. You know, at least most of the commercial producers did. Uh, quickness to a tap, you know, we're finding that the quicker that we get that tap out of the tree at the end of season, um, the, the less uh, stain column that we're seeing internally inside that tree. So really, you know, let's, you know, as soon as that uh, syrup is, has gone off flavor and we're done boiling, let's get them trees untapped and let's let that tree get itself healed up. So, okay. So when we talk about compartmentalizing, this is really what we're looking at is this stain column. So once we tap this tree, this dark spot is our tap hole. And once we tap that tree, this dark wood or this non-functional wood will no longer conduct sap for the life of that tree. So this is that tree's healing mechanism so that if an infection would enter this tap hole, that it can't spread, you know, above or below that tap hole. So that's really the tree's natural way of healing itself. So when we look at the stain column, from a, a width wise, we're usually twice the width of our tap hole or twice the diameter of our tap hole. So on a 7 16 the stain column on a 7 16 tap, stain column usually runs about an inch in width. Okay. On a 7 16 tap, this stain usually runs about 12 inches above and 12 inches below this tap hole on average, not all the time. Like I say, we can't always see what's going on underneath the bark. Um, with the 5 16 taps, it definitely does shorten it up. So on a 7 six, or on a 5 16 tap, usually six inches above, six inches below the tap hole. 
is is what we slow that stain column down to. So like say we by using that smaller diameter tap, we we definitely take a lot better care of our trees and we put less non-functional wood, you know, into that tree. Uh staining on the back side of our tap bowl. So like if we're drilling in two inches deep, say for example, for a tap bowl depth, that stain will go in roughly about an eighth inch deeper than the depth of our tap bowl. Okay. So when we talk about sanitizers, so this top slide here, you know, this is what paraformaldehyde did to our trees, okay? This is a, a regular stain column that we would see with a standard tap. And this is a stain column that we would see with paraformaldehyde. So what happened with that paraformaldehyde is we took that nice clean stain column and we exaggerated dramatically. So we put that much more non-functional wood into our tree. You know, so this is where I'm going to give my spiel about, you know, let's keep the sanitizers out of the tap hole. We don't want to be spraying alcohol into our tap holes because alcohol is not an approved sanitizer by the FDA in the United States. It is an approved sanitizer for Canada in their tubing system. But like I say, isopropyl alcohol and alcohol is not an approved sanitizer by the FDA here in the U.S., so like I say, we want to make sure we're keeping the sanitizers out of that tap bowl. We want to make sure that we're giving that tree the proper time to heal and we're not extending that healing process so that we're not exaggerating that, that dark wood column in the inside of that tree. So let's say keep sanitizers out. Tools usually for tapping, you know, uh, CDL has a precision tapper to give a, a better quality tap bowl. Um, you know, that can be used traditional uh, you know, rechargeable drills can be used. Either one of them can be used. They both work very, very well. One of the essential tools really for tapping is going to be a tapping bit. So when we talk about, you know, tapping bits, I've, I've got a, a great story about this. I won't call sugar makers cheap, but I'll definitely call them thrifty. And my dad is one of those. So, you know, years ago, dad said, well, jeepers, you know, we don't really need to buy the tapping bits. They're 20 or $21 are awful expensive and, and I don't really see the benefits. So about oh, 10, 12 years ago, I chucked one up on his, in his drill at a lunch break and he went back out to tapping. He drilled the first hole and, and looked at the bit, put the drill back in his holster, kept walking through the woods, drilled the second hole, looked at the bit and kept on walking. And by the time he drilled the third hole, he asked me where the bit came from. And I said, well, that's one of those, you know, expensive tapping bits that, you know, you didn't want to buy. So when you look at these tapping bits, they're, they're a very unique bit. They're really designed to tap trees, okay? They have a 90 degree tip, which allow for a very fast start on all surfaces of the tree. You know, bark is definitely not a smooth surface. We, if we use a drill bit with a lesser point on it, that drill will want to walk across the surface and not start very easily. So that 90 degree tip on that drill uh, usually works very well to start a, a quick, fast hole. Um, maximum tap, you know, with that bit, about 2,000 holes. As a commercial producer, we run our, our, our drill bits about 2,000 holes. And uh, we, 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 we send the bit to actually my bits go to the shop and I use them up the rest of the way in the shop. Um, you can tell right away when that bit starts to get dull. Our batteries on our drill don't start to last. That hole doesn't drill as clean. It's kind of raggy. Uh, never try to resharpen them because not only is the tip of that drill bit sharp, it's the side fluting that goes down the side of the drill bits that's extremely sharp as well. And that, that tight flute and that sharp flute eject the chips and sawdust out of our tap hole and leave us with a, a very clean, very good tap hole. You know, so the other thing when we talk about the sharpness of the drill is, is we're cutting through the cells of that wood. And as we saw on a couple slides ago, you know, we see those channels, you know, enhanced, of course, or a lot larger than what they are, but you see those channels and that's, we're cutting through those channels with that drill bit. If we have a nice, nice sharp drill bit, we cut through that channel and it leaves a nice opening. If we're using a dull drill bit, you know, we're going to see kind of a raggy cut to our tap hole and that tap hole, will, we're going to, we're going to bend some of those wood fibers kind of over those, those openings in those channels and we're going to kind of close that off so like say that sharp drill bit really does help as far as the yield goes as well so that that you know we're cutting a nice clean tap hole into that tree so that sap can run out of there very very easily the other thing that goes along with it the raggy tap holes for lack of better terminology that we're talking about you know if you're using vacuum like we do as a commercial producer 
that raggy cut tap hole doesn't want to seal quite as nicely as that nice clean cut tap hole. So a tapping bit is really kind of one of those essential tools. You know, if you're a hobbyist, they come in a nice plastic case. You're only going to drill a, you know, a hundred holes a year. This thing's going to last you a long time. At the end of the season, get it put back in the case and save it for next year. So like I say, just one of those kind of essential tools that we, we talk about. So the next one we're going to talk about is, is tapping angle. So for a lot of years, we were always instructed, you know, to try and drill in at a, at a five to 10 degree uphill angle, you know, and that's really not necessary. The only time I like to see a, a little bit of an angle like that is if I've got some real old style cast aluminum taps um, and I'm using bags or buckets so that I get that sap running down that tap and it wants to drip off the end. It doesn't want to drip back on my tap. Um, University of Vermont has done some extensive research over the last couple of years that there is no yield difference from a slight uphill angle to a straight angle. Uh, so there's, like I say, there's really no yield difference. So you can drill in at a five to 10 degree uphill angle, or you can drill straight in either, either method's going to work very well for you. You know, if we do get at a downhill angle, we will see some ponding in the back of our tap hole, which will, you know, through the freeze thaw process, will push them taps out of that tree. Okay. One thing that I want to talk about a little bit here quickly is uh, a depth stopper. And a lot of people want to use a depth stopper, and that's fine. If you're going to use a depth stopper, you know, if you're in an even age stand of timber, I would say a depth stop is going to work very well. So say, for example, I want to drill a two inch deep tap hole and I walk out into my wood lot and all of my maple trees out in that particular wood lot are all 14 inches in diameter. Something came through that wood lot, whether it be a windstorm, a logging event, whatever the case may be, something came through that wood lot to make all of these trees very close in age. And that's why the diameter is very similar. So when we look at the diameter of these trees, say for example, a nice 14 inch maple tree, the, the bark layer on that tree is very thin. And if I want a two inch tap hole, I set my depth to two inches. On my depth stopper, I'm gonna make it pretty close to a two inch tap hole. Now where you can possibly run into some problems is if you use a depth stopper on an uneven age stand of timber. So what I mean by an uneven age stand of timber is you walk out into your woods and there might be 10 inch diameter maples and 16 inch diameter maples and 48 inch diameter maples and 36 inch diameter maples. So all of those trees have a different thickness of bark layer. Typically, when we get into these larger diameter sugar maples, we get a very thick bark layer on them. So we want to make sure that we are getting that tap hole into some nice white wood. So say, for example, I had my depth stopper set at, say, an inch and three quarter, and I went and I tapped in an uneven age stand of timber, I might have some problems on them really large diameter trees that my tap hole is not quite deep enough. You know, so be kind of mindful of the timber that you're tapping. You know, next time a tree goes down in your woods, you know, buck some blocks off it. Look at the thickness of that of that bark layer of that tree to make sure you're you're getting the tap set into some good white wood. You know, also look at the also look at the heartwood of that tree. You know, on these smaller diameter trees on your 10 inch and 12 inch diameter maples, if you have a couple of those that go over or die off or whatever the case may be, buck some blocks off and, and look at the diameter of that heartwood. You know, maybe, you know, in your particular case, that heartwood in them 10 and 12 inch trees is, is very large. And if I'm drilling a, a two inch diameter or two inch deep tap hole, then I'm getting into that heartwood. You know, I may want to shallow up my tapping depth and go to an inch and three quarter. So like I say, just be kind of mindful as you're, you know, out in your wood lot working out there. And if you're cutting some trees down for firewood or cutting some blowdowns, you know, that you're, you kind of see what's going on internally inside that tree thickness of bark layer and heartwood, so. Tapping guidelines, you know, so always be perpendicular to the bark. Um, you know, this is, this is a very good practice, but I will just give a kind of a word of caution, like a tree like this. Say, for example, I drill my tap hole here, and next year I move over three inches to the left, and I drill in two inches, I run the risk or the opportunity of possibly catching catching that stain column or catching that uh, old tap hole. You know, so be mindful as you tap perpendicular to the surfaces that the drill is going in this direction. And the next time that you tap, you may have to go over five or six inches to get into some nice white wood to, to get, to, you know, to get past that tap hole right there. So 
just keep in mind that you know different things are going on internally inside the tree there. Um, possibly, you know, some possibilities of, of you know, poor tap holes. Um, you know, we always want to make sure that we have both hands on that drill when we're tapping to make sure the drill is nice and stable. Um, you know, usually when we tap overhead, you know, we do pretty good pushing the drill bit into the tree. Um, say if we're tapping tubing, for example, and we're tapping, up, you know, up high, we drill into that tree, we usually do pretty well. It's when we pull the drill out of the tree that we run into problems. Typically, if we're tapping overhead, we'll push in nice and straight. But when we pull the drill out of the tree, sometimes we're pulling down on it. And that usually will make a little bit of an oval-shaped tap hole, which we're using round taps. And like I say, it's kind of tough to seal that up. So we want to make sure that we're drilling in as straight to that tree and coming out as straight as we possibly can. You know, and that's one of the things, like say, that the precision tapper does is it, it helps pull that drill bit out of there. It is spring loaded. It helps, you know, really reduce the amount of ovalness that you put to your hole. Uh, tapping guidelines. We want to start slow to mark the spot. You know, if we've got some moss or some lichen on that tree that we want to scrape off so we got a nice clean spot to start that drill bit, especially if we're working all the way around the diameter of that tree, we might get onto a side of the tree where there's some moss. If we have a tapping hammer with us with a nice sharp blade, we should clean that surface off, clean that moss off prior to starting to drill that hole. So we got a nice clean spot to drill. Drill speed should usually be between around 1400 to 1600 RPMs. We want to make sure the drill is turning when we go into the tap hole, of course. And then when we pull out, we want that drill running so that, like say that we have a nice clean tap hole. And I touched base on this earlier that if we want to, uh, you know, we only want to use that depth stop if we're in an even age stand of timber where the bark layers are all very similar to one another. So, tap flow versus depth. Um, really, by today's standards, you know, we're going to recommend a tapping depth of around an inch and three quarter to two inches deep. Um, that is usually going to be the, the case for almost all the tapping that we do. Um, we want to make sure that, you know, tap is seated into some nice white wood. You know, if we get our tap seated in too far, which we're going to talk about later, we can reduce our yield and reduce our sugar just a little bit. So, so overdriving taps. So this is some research that was done by University of uh, Vermont um, on seeding taps, sugar content, and yield. Okay, so if if we look at this first uh, column here as our properly seated tap. This is yield on a vacuum tubing system of roughly, you know, 27 gallons of sap per tap. And this would be like, say, our properly seated uh, tap, properly seated yield. And then when we look at our sugar content is 2.33 bricks. Okay, so the next set that they did or the next set of items that they uh, researched was okay, if I drive that tap 50% more than I'm supposed to. So if I drive that tap roughly 50% more than what I'm supposed to, I see about a 9.3% loss in yield. And I also see a reduction in the sugar content of my sap. So what do we know about the maple tree? So our sweetest sap is housed in our farthest or our, our most external wood. So the latest layer of wood that has grown around that tree has the highest sugar content. So if I close off the channels by overdriving that tap in that outside layer of wood, I'm also reducing, not only am I reducing my yield, I'm reducing my sugar content. The next thing here is 100% overdriven tap. So say for example, on a tubing tap, I. I, I tap that tap in basically as far as I could take it, you know, I would see a 42% loss in yield. And like say sugar, once I get to that point is gonna remain about the same on that fully overdriven tap. But so there is some definite correlation between overdriving taps or tapping taps in too far. Um, there's a correlation with yield as far as total of gallons of sap per tap. And there is definitely a correlation with the sugar. So just kind of keep that in mind you know, when seeding your taps. You know, so this is one of the things that we look at, you know, this is another one of those I call essential tools. It's just a simple tapping hammer. Um, you know, the biggest mistake that we see a lot of sugars, sugar makers make is they'll, they'll go to the garage and they'll grab a 32 ounce east wing hammer and they'll start putting their taps into their trees. Well, 
you know, we're not setting spikes, we're not building a building, we're setting our taps, okay? So ideally, when we're putting our taps into our tree, we should be using a hammer that's got a weight of at least eight ounces or less. Um, you know, these tapping hammers are typically an eight ounce weight. If you look at the back side of the tapping hammer here, it's got a nice sharp blade on the back to remove any moss or lichen from that tree uh, to clean that surface up before we start drilling. Um, very nice, you know, very nice tool. Like I say, it's it's one of those 20 or $25 tools that that I deem is, is, is almost an essential tool for, for a successful job out in the sugar bush. So, you know, the problem that we run into is if we get into tapping too hard, you know, we should be able to tap on that tap, 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 and you should hear it hit solid. Once we hear that tap hit solid, you know, we don't want to continue to drive that tap. So a great example of this, you know, is if you're a, a hobbyist and you're using gravity methods of production and you walk up to the side of your maple tree in the spring and there's a giant wet spot on the side of your tree. Well, what you did is you, is you split the wood above and below that tap hole because you drove that tap in too far. And what happened is that that sap is leaking out the crack that you created above and below that tap hole. So keep that in mind, like say we wanna make sure that we, we get that tap seated so it stays in the tree, but we don't wanna drive it too hard, okay? The other thing is too, we, we create a little larger wound, you know, column with that, it takes a little bit longer to heal. So like say eight ounce hammer or less, you know, when that tap hits solid, we don't, we don't wanna keep hitting it, we wanna stop, so. Uh, spouts, there is a wide variety of different spouts. This is showing just a bunch of tubing spouts that can be used. And then that's a whole nother conversation for another day. The biggest thing I'm going to talk about taps is tap sanitation. So me as a commercial producer, when I am tapping my trees every year on my tubing system, I'm putting a new tap on. Okay, that new plastic tap that I put on gets me about 17% seven, more production cost of the tap roughly is around 28 cents per tap, but it pays over $2 in extra production. Now, I understand if you're a hobbyist and you're using, you know, cast aluminum taps or stainless steel taps that cost several dollars a piece, you're not going to throw them away every year, okay? But I will say if you're going to use those taps, make sure that you sanitize that tap. You know, so what do we know about that maple tree? The minute that I put a dirty contaminated tap into that nice freshly cut tap hole, I trigger that tree's healing mechanism to start the compartmentalization process, which in turn starts to limit my sap flow the day I put that dirty tap into that tree. Now, if I take a sanitized tap or a new tubing tap, and I put that tap into that clean tap hole, the tree doesn't know the difference, okay? And that's where we're seeing that increase in yield is I'm not triggering that tree to start that process of compartmentalization, which in turn reduces our yield. So like say, cast aluminum taps, stainless steel taps, whatever the case may be, if those taps are a couple bucks a piece, you know, let's get them sanitized, let's get them clean and, and make sure we're doing that every year. If you're a tubing producer, you know, 28 cents for a tap to get a $2 return is a, is a pretty good return on investment. So that's what we're going to talk about with taps. Um, usually with a tapping demonstration, when we're in person, we got a tree set up and we, we tap a tree right there, but we're doing this one via Zoom. So we're going to talk about it a little bit. You know, selecting the tap location is the most important step of this process. And, and really the, the tapping process is really the most important part of tapping maple trees to be successful. Because if we don't tap that tree, right, we can have the nicest sugar house and the shiniest evaporator and, and everything else. But if we're not getting the sap back to the sugar house to process it into maple syrup, because we put a poor tap hole into a tree, you know, we're really limiting our success. So like say, selecting that tap location on that tree is really the most important step of the process. Um, start the drill, drill slowly. Uh, you know, to, to, to start the hole slowly so that we don't develop a burr. And we really see this, especially when we're tapping these softer wood varieties like our, our reds and our silvers, our red maples and our silver maples. Um, if, we, if we hit that just a little bit too fast with that drill bit, 
sometimes we'll have a, a little sliver that of, of wood chip that hangs on. And if we're not careful, when we put our cap in our tree, we fold that little sliver over and we can create a leak. So like say, uh, a small, just a, a quick uh, trigger hit with a drill, get that drill to, to set its point on the tree and then continue drilling with that softwood varieties. Um, take your time when tapping. You know, this is not a race. Um, you know, us as a commercial producer, we go out, we tap, you know, around a thousand taps a day and we quit. You know, if it only took us three and a half or four hours, we quit. Um, if you get fatigued, you get tired in the woods, you don't start looking at those trees correctly. Um, you're not looking at, you know, for last year's tap hole. You're not, you know, staying with your tapping pattern. Um, you know, if you're on snowshoes, you're, you're, you're tuckered out from walking through the deep woods in the snow and not so much this year, of course, but, you know, you just don't do a good job, you know? So like say, take your time when I'm, you know, tapping. If it takes you a couple extra days to tap, the increase in yield will definitely outweigh the, you know, the, the couple days of loss that you had. So uh, two hands on the drill, want to make sure that you're, you know, you're steady on the drill. You know, if you've got to tap up higher, you know, make sure that you're pulling that drill straight out of that tap hole so that we're not creating that oval shaped tap hole. So, okay, so we're going to talk quickly about some examples of tapping problems. Okay, and we're going to explain kind of what's going on here. So when we look at a tubing system, um, this is a scenario that a drop line was too short. So say, for example, I had a very small drop line and I could only reach this area of the tree. And you can see all of my tap holes, all of these dark brown spots are our old tap holes. So we couldn't reach anywhere else on that tree because this is the only spot that we were tapping because our hose wasn't long enough. We look at this side of the tree, all kinds of white wood. Now, so when we're looking at the tree this way, this dark brown area will no longer conduct sap. So every time we see that dark brown area, those are areas that we, you know, that will no longer conduct sap. Okay, this is an example of a tree that was tapped too small. Started tapping this tree when it was about six inches. Every time they drilled in, they were pretty much getting into the heartwood of that tree. Okay, so that is the problem. So when you look at this tree when it was tapped when it was six inches, after the compartmentalization took place, there were very few spots that had white wood left that would actually conduct sap. You know, so basically all of these little white spots were the only spots available to conduct sap anymore. And that's the reason that we don't want to start tapping those trees at that small a diameter. We got to make sure that tree is large enough, grows sustainably enough, that we're not putting in more dark non-functional wood than we can grow white wood back in the course of the year. Okay. Um, another example of tree tap too small, we were like say getting into the heartwood here. Um, you know, poor tapping practices. Here's a tap hole into a tap hole into a tap hole. You know, this is a great example of not having a well-established tapping pattern and, and, and basically drilling right into old tap holes, which basically this one here basically had, you know, first year you did fine, second year you pretty much got hardly anything third year, you know, you were clipping that hole as well. You know, so like say, we really want to be mindful and develop that tapping pattern. Okay, uh, this is an example of paraformaldehyde. So if we go back, you see these nice tight stain columns here. You know, when we look at the use of paraformaldehyde and what that did internally inside that tree, our stain columns just kind of spread all over the place. You know, so we didn't have that well-defined stain column. So we just put a ton of non-functional wood in the inside of that tree. Let's say this product has been banned, but you know, this is just an example to keep that sanitizer out of that tap hole. Um, here's a good example. This is what a 7 16 tap is going to look like. This is what a 5 16 tap is going to look like. So when you look at the size of this stain column versus that stain column, you know, this is why here in the mid 90s, the majority of the commercial producers in the maple syrup world uh, switched out those seven sixteenths taps for five sixteenths taps because we could, you know, we could take care of our trees just, you know, that much better. You know, more examples of not having a good tapping pattern, uh, you know, holes running into each other like this, holes running into each other here, you know, so basically we're, we're tapping right into that stained non-functional wood and not really getting much, if any, sap out of that tap hole if possible, so...
Um, you know, this is a good example of over tap down the South. You know, this is that, you know, that advice that my grandfather gave me as a kid growing up that we should always tap on the South side of the tree. Well, what happens is, is we keep tapping on the South side of that tree before you know it, there's a little white wood left there, a little white wood there, a little white wood there, a little dab of white wood there, some here, a little bit here. Before we know it, there's no white wood left on that side of the tree. So if we continue to over tap on that south side of that tree and not use that tapping pattern to get all the way around, we'll, you know, basically after a period of time, we won't hardly get any sap out of that tree. But if you look at the north side of this tree over here, there's not a tap hole in it. So if we can, like say, work our way all the way around that tree, and yeah, granted, you know, a little, you know, you're going to be a couple of days later on the north side of the tree to leak a little sap out of there. But I would tell you what, I would take that tap hole here versus putting one in here because there's there's very little, if any, yield potential left on this side of the tree. So, so this is more of a, you know, what look, you know, what's going on in, internally inside of the tree. You can look at, you know, old tap holes inside the tree. This is that compartmentalized uh, stain column that we see in that tree. You know, the next slide shows, this is, you know, an example of not a perfect tapping pattern, but it ain't bad. You know, we've got the stain column here with that, you know, with that tap. We've got another stain column here with that tap. They're not running into each other. We've got white wood in between them yet that's still conducting sap. You know, we've got another tap hole here with the stain column. And you'll notice that you know, stain columns, we can't see what's going on internally inside the tree. So you look at this year, when we tapped this tree had a very short stain column, this one had a very long stain column. You know, this stain column here ended abruptly on this side of it, and it was, you know, longer on the other side. This is a really good example of, you know, like say white wood left between, you know, good columns of wood in between to conduct sap, yet a nice tapping pattern. You know, the bottom slide is, is really an example of what not to do. You know, we've got a We've got a tap hole here that was, you know, probably there's another tap hole back in here somewhere. And basically we tapped right into that non-functional wood. Once, twice, three times, we pretty much tapped into there. First time we got sap, the second and third time our yields were definitely limited. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind. Well, most of the side story here. Okay, if you got a tubing system, you know, if we see microbial contamination in that tubing system, we want to make sure that we're, we're getting those drop lines replaced uh, prior to season getting started. Um, so what link the drop line to you is, so now if you're tapping on, on, on buckets and running hoses down into buckets, if you're tapping with a tubing system, you know, remember that when that tree goes into a state of vacuum in the evening, um, we can draw sap back into that tree. So when we look at sap drawback, usually on a piece of 5 16 uh, maple tubing, we will draw sap back to that tap hole roughly about 12 inches at night when that tree goes under vacuum. So what we really do in our woodlots is we use 36 inch uh, length drop lines and we try to make sure that we tap those trees as high as we can so that we have you know, 24 inches of, of nice line that's going straight down so that we don't have the opportunity to draw that sap back in that into that tree. You know, if you're going to be a hobby producer and you're going to tap some some buckets and set them on the ground, I would highly recommend that you not use 3 16 tubing to do that. With a smaller inside diameter of that line, we can draw sap back up to 12 feet in a piece of 3 16 tubing versus a foot in 5 16 tubing. So keep that in mind that if you have that hose down and it's halfway down into your pail at night, we can draw some sap back into the tree from your bucket. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, if your woodlot has been tapped for a long period of time, you know, on a tubing system, you know, you may want to get some longer drop lines to, to get up out of that stain column, create yourself a, a new tapping band so that you're into some nice white wood. Um, you know, if your if your tree has, you know, if your woods has been tapped for a prolonged period of time, say always on the south side, you know, start putting your taps, you know, start maybe on the east side of your tree and work your way around to the west side of the tree and, and give that south side of that tree a break for a little bit so we can grow some nice white wood back on that side of the tree and, and get our yields back. Um, like I say, just another note, you know, make sure that you're using flex tubing for, for drop lines and stuff like that. That really is a nice flexible material for for making drop lines. Uh, drop line replacement, you know, we're looking at, 
you know, so, so what, what causes that tree to reduce its yield? Well, in a tubing system, really that first three feet of tubing that is closest to the tap hole is really gonna determine your yield reduction. So me as a commercial producer, I use that new tap every year. And what I do is we're on a, on a, on a rotation, we change all of our drop lines or roughly that first three feet of hose that is closest to that tap, we change those every three years. By changing them every three years, we manage really that level of microbial contamination that's in that hose that's closest to the tap hole. The closer that we keep that uh, hose or the cleaner that we keep that hose closest to the tree, the better yields that we're going to have. If we if we do draw some sap back into that tap hole, we're not drawing a, a highly contaminated level of, of liquid back into that tap hole if that first three feet of tubing is, is relatively clean. Um, tubing sanitizing, we're talking about this just a little bit. Um, you know, if you are going to sanitize your tubing, you know, use a calcium based bleach uh, to avoid salts. You know, so if you're going to use a, a traditional, uh, you know, go to the grocery store and buy some bleach, which is usually sodium hypochlorite, um, that, that sodium based bleach will salt out and it will attract the deer and the squirrels and the chipmunks. And they'll think your woods is full of blue licorice and they'll eat you out of house at home. No different when sanitizing plastic buckets, sanitizing bag holders, sanitizing taps, uh, sodium or sodium hypochlorite or that sodium based bleach, if it is not rinsed thoroughly, will cause the rodents to, to chew on your plastic buckets and everything else. So let's say if you are going to use a sodium hypochlorite bleach, it is a fair sanitizer, it works well. Just make sure that we're doing a very large water intervention afterwards to make sure there's no bleach residue uh, left on any of the, that material that can you know either go into your sap or attract your rodents. Like I say, the best thing you can do, calcium-based bleach does work very well. Uh, we want to clean our tubing in the fall. You know, it, it has been you know done a, a lot of times. You know, in the spring, people want to clean their tubing. Um, what do we know about microbial contamination? Um, it grows very rapidly when the temperature goes over 50 degrees. You know, so if we sanitize immediately after season is over with, um, we really lose the benefits of that sanitizer by the time fall rolls around. You know, the microbial uh, level or the microbial contamination level in that tubing system will be extremely high. So I will say that, um, you know, if we want to be successful in sanitizing that tubing, especially if you're using 3 16 tubing, that that definitely is, is way more critical on sanitizing than the 5 16 um, Like I say, we want to make sure that we are uh, doing that in the fall year. Let's, let's try to get that as close to freeze up as we possibly can. Like I say, once that temperature gets over 50, we see that stuff grow rather rapidly. We do it late in the fall when the air temperatures are very low, we'll get very little microbial contamination or very little, little microbial growth, you know, that can contaminate that system. Um, you know, do not use vacuum to draw a cleaning solution into the tubing system, you know. So what do we know about, you know, uh, sanitizers? It's all about contact time. You know, so if we're, you know, taking and leaving the vacuum on on a vacuum tubing system and just sucking a little sanitizer in through that tubing system and it quickly sucks itself all the way down to the main line that we didn't really have enough contact time there to, to really do anything for us. You know, so if we're going to, you know, use a, a bleach-based sanitizer, we want to pump the system full of it, cap it off, you know, we should have at least 15 minutes of contact. And then by all means, make sure we have a tremendous amount of water wash or water flush afterward, you know, to make sure that we don't have any any uh, chemical left in that system. So, you know, when to tap, you know, ideally, you know, you know, ideally on a big tubing system, 10 to 15 days before the first run. The way we manage our systems today, we tap pretty early, you know, so give you a little background, you know, we had already started tapping in January. Granted, now this is on a tubing system. I would recommend this with bags or buckets. You know, we were on a tubing system. We, we tapped early in January and that's what allowed us to, you know, get going here on the, on the tail end of January, first part of February and, and make a little syrup early here um, over the last uh, week and a half here or so. Um, you know, if you don't have a, a lot of taps, you know, like on bags or buckets and you're a hobby producer, you know, try and time that out closer to the sap run. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves and, and get out there too early. You know, like say orientation of the sugar bush, you know, if we got a nice warm salt slope, 
that's probably going to run a little bit quicker than a north slope will. You know, uh, altitude, we don't got to worry about that too much here in Wisconsin. You know, where I live, you know, altitude does play into it a little bit. You know, we are at about, you know, our most of our woods is here. Where I'm at in northeast Wisconsin, sit at about, oh, you know, 1450 to 1650 feet above sea level. You get into some, you know, lower lying areas, you know, that, 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 that woodlot warms up a, a, a quite a bit quicker. You know, in size of the sugar bush, you know, I mean, we've got a, quite a few taps to set. So we like to get out there and get going early. Um, you know, if you only got a couple hundred to set, you know, we can, you can easily do that in a day or a day and a half. It's, it's you know, so let's say try to time it out. You know, this year, unfortunately, I don't have any great advice. I know a, a fair bit of people were tapped in for the, for the runs that took place here just recently. But, you know, there's a lot of hobbyists that, you know, with the bags and buckets, it's, it's kind of dicey to go that early. So, I would think on this next warm up, we're going to see a, lo a lot of people get going. So, um, when to tap, you know, if if the tree if it is below freezing and you're and you're out there, and the trees are froze, you know, you know, we want to take a little more caution. You know, if if it's above freezing and the trees are thawed, sap is running. We really don't have any effect. You know, so I guess where we're going with this is, you know. When temperatures are below freezing, trees are definitely a lot more prone to cracking. You know, our softwood varieties, you know, our red maple and our silver maple definitely crack easier than our hardwood species, which are our sugar maple and our black maple. You know, so like I say, just take a little more care and set and taps. You know, one of the things that we do at our sugar house is we, we usually try to avoid tapping if we're below 15 degrees Fahrenheit. We try to make sure the weather's just a little bit warmer that than that we don't want to like say run the risk of of you know like say doing any you know putting any cracks in any trees or anything like that person can tap roughly about 500 taps a day on a tubing system you know snow coverage weather you know if repairs need to be done the biggest thing is there if you tap more than that a day you're going to have problems with quality you know we probably tap a little less than that we're probably in that you know 400 taps per man per day when we're out there like say we just want to make sure that we're doing the best job we can you know, maintaining that tapping pattern, making sure we're locating that last year's tap hole and making sure that we're drilling a good, you know, good hole in that tree to get the best, <laughs> the best possible yield that we can. Um, other consideration just quickly, you know, never stop the vacuum pumps, you know, until the lines are frozen to eliminate that sap to draw back to the tap hole. And this is really kind of a critical one, you know, untapping should be done as soon as possible after the last run. You know, we're seeing people that don't get out there and pull their taps right away. They let them in for a prolonged period of time. And what will actually happen is we'll actually put about 20% more non-functional wood or stained, stained wood into that tree. You know, so the longer that tap remains in that tree after season is done, the longer that stain column gets. So the quickness to untap is, is definitely a lot healthier for our trees. And definitely the taps pull out a lot harder. You know, once that tap has been set in there for a prolonged period of time, if you leave them in there until June or July, that tap is definitely going to pull a lot harder. So, Tony, I think uh, I think I kept it 